And so let's jump right in, part five, Wagging the Moon Doggy by David McGowan. Stars are not the only thing missing in the moon photos. Also conspicuously absent is any indication that the lunar modules actually landed in the locations in which they were photographed. Specifically, there is no crater visible under any of the modules, despite the fact that NASA's own artist renderings clearly show the presence of a substantial crater. Also, not a speck of dust appears to have been displaced by the 10,000-pound reverse thrust engine that powered the alleged descent. NASA's artist renderings also depict a considerable quantity of smoke and flames shooting out from the bottom of the modules, though nothing of the sort is visible in the purported video footage of the first landing of a lunar module. And it's linked here if you want to watch that. Allegedly shot from inside the module as it sat down on lunar soil. In addition, despite the ridiculously close proximity of the immensely powerful rocket engine, no noise from that engine can be heard on the video. We're go, same time, we're go. Altitude, velocity, light. Three and a half down, 220 feet, 15 forward, 11 forward, coming down nicely, 200 feet, four and a half down, five and a half down, 60 seconds, lights on, Six. down two and a half, forward, forward, That's 40 feet down, two and a half, picking up some dust. Four forward, four forward, drift into the right a little. That's eight. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We copy it down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. As can be seen in the photo above, the area directly under what is supposed to be the nozzle of the descent stage engine is completely undisturbed. Not only is there no crater, there is no sign of scorching, and none of the small moon rocks and not a speck of the lunar soil has been displaced. And if you refer back to the earlier close-up of the module's landing pod, you'll see that not so much of a single grain of lunar soil settled onto the lunar modules while they were setting down. Your initial response to this may well be, well, duh, why shouldn't the surface of the moon be undisturbed? Glad you asked. The answer is that the lunar modules were not placed upon the moon by the hand of God. They had to actually land there. And in order for them to land there in one piece, they had to make use of the powerful reverse thrust rockets. If they hadn't, they would have made landings roughly comparable to a piano falling off the balcony of a high-rise apartment building. But, you say, isn't the gravitational pull of the moon considerably less than that of the Earth? Well, of course it is, but that does not render objects weightless. A vehicle of a curb weight of 33,000 pounds here on Earth, what the lunar modules weighed, according to NASA, still weighs close to three tons on the moon, so it's not going to make a very soft landing without assistance. And the assistance options were necessarily limited. NASA could not have used parachutes, such as were used with the returning command modules, because parachutes don't really work without air. So that would have been a dead giveaway that the landings were faked. They also couldn't use a helicopter-type rotor because those also don't work in an environment devoid of atmosphere. What they allegedly used then to provide the necessary brakes was a powerful reverse thrust rocket engine. That is why, in the artist renderings of the landings, the landings obviously couldn't be filmed because no one was supposed to be there yet. An enormous blast of flame and a hot gas is seen shooting out of the bottom of the module. This massive reverse force would have served to counteract the effects of the moon's gravitational pull. 
allowing the module to gently set down in the lunar dust, unharmed and intact. And needless to say, that is kind of important when the very same vehicle is your only ride home. Pity bunkers, by the way, like to pretend as if the hoax theorists made those artist renderings up themselves as if to say, hey, look over here. I just made up this drawing of what I think the landings should look like, and NASA's landings look nothing like my drawing. The reality, though, is that NASA's own artists provided those images based on the way that NASA claimed the modules would perform. What the debunkers are telling you, in other words, is that NASA didn't really understand how their own technology was supposed to work. Given the manner in which the modules allegedly landed, the problem here is that, unless the landing surface was paved with, say, concrete, an inordinate amount of material should have been displaced by the force of the rocket blast as the module was setting down. Jumping down, how then did the modules get there? Could it be that the lunar surface was so compact that even the considerable force of the rocket could not dislodge it? That might be a credible explanation were it not for the fact that the astronauts themselves, who, with the moon's reduced gravitational pull, weighed in at about 30 pounds apiece, maybe 60 pounds each with the additional alleged weight of their packs, made readily identifiable footprints from the moment their feet hit the ground. It appeared, in fact, as though the lunar soil had roughly the same consistency as baby powder. And yet, amazingly enough, not a single grain of this soil seems to have been displaced by the landing of the modules. The debunkers, naturally enough, have an explanation for this. According to them, it's all about throttle control. Sure, the rocket on the lander was capable of 10,000 pounds of thrust, but they had a throttle. They fired the rocket hard enough to deorbit and slow enough to land on the moon. But they didn't need to thrust that hard as they approached the lunar surface. They throttled down to about 3,000 pounds of thrust. Let's try again to inject a little sanity into this discussion, shall we? First of all, no one with an ounce of common sense is going to cut the engine and let their three-ton spaceship simply drop to the lunar surface. Nor are they going to cruise on in while progressively easing up on the throttle, effortlessly setting the module down, like a car pulls into a parking spot, as if they had been landing lunar modules since the day they were born. Because the reality is, is that six astronauts who allegedly landed six lunar modules hadn't done it before, and they only had one chance to get it right. Because that lunar module was their only ride home. And if they damaged it in any way, they weren't going home, ever. They weren't going to do anything except die within days in the most desolate place imaginable. And that is why it is perfectly obvious that, if they had really gone to the moon, they would not under any circumstances have landed the module either of the ways that the debunkers have suggested. Has anyone ever seen a helicopter land? That is essentially how you would land a lunar module as well. The basic technique is to line yourself up with your landing site while hovering a fairly short distance above the ground. With the module, I presume, you would hold your position by utilizing those clusters of horns. Then, when you're stabilized and lined up just where you want to be, you very slowly ease off the throttle so as to very gently set it down. And if you've never done it before, you're definitely going to want to take your time. And that is why there should quite obviously be blast craters under those lunar modules. That is why NASA itself indicated that there would be blast craters under the lunar modules. And that is also why it is fundamentally impossible for the modules to be as impeccably clean and dust-free as they are in all of NASA's photos. And no amount of spinning from the debunkers will ever explain that away. As previously mentioned, there was much about the Apollo project to stand in awe of. Every individual phase of the mission was, in and of itself, a breathtaking technological achievement. Just blasting men into Earth orbit is a daunting task. So much so in the nearly half century that has passed since the first two nations did it, the U.S. and the U.S.S.R., only one other, China, has managed to join that elite club. And China has only done it a few times. In the entire history of space exploration, just over 500 men and women have ever orbited the Earth. Achieving Earth orbit was just the beginning. Then there was the 234,000-mile journey through the unknown to get to the moon, on a single take of gas in an unshielded spaceship. Then there was the main ship giving birth to the lunar module, and that untested lunar module, then flying down and making a perfect landing on the surface of the moon. Then there was that same untested lunar module blasting off from the surface of the moon without the assistance of any ground crew and ascending 69 miles to attain lunar orbit. Then there was the ever-reliable lunar module finding, catching, and docking with another ship while in lunar orbit, utilizing yet more untested technology. 
then there was the command module shedding the lunar module and then commencing that 234,000 mile journey back home. But as remarkable as it was to get the astronauts safely to and from the moon, their survival while on the moon was equally remarkable. To say that the moon is an environment incompatible with the survival of humans would be a considerable understatement. Which brings us to our next topic of discussion, those amazing NASA moonwalking suits. Those suits were able to provide the astronauts with everything they needed to stay alive in the moon's harsh environment. Remember NASA's elaborate rendering of what a moon workstation protected from space radiation would look like? Neil and Buzz didn't need any of that fancy stuff because they were wearing the magic suits. And those extreme temperatures of plus 260 Fahrenheit to negative 280 Fahrenheit? Not a problem when you're wearing the magic suit. Not only could they provide the cooling needed to combat the searing temperatures in the sun, but they could also provide the heat to counteract those frigid shadows. As can be seen in NASA's photos, the egress side of the lunar modules, the side with the ladder and hatch, was usually in the shade, though almost always well lit. What that means is that, after traipsing around in the sun for a spell, the astronauts would have to step into the shadows to re-enter the spacecraft. And when they did so, those spacesuits were apparently smart enough to react instantly and switch over from turbocharged air conditioning to blast furnace heating in the blink of an eye. In addition to providing radiation protection that today's technology is unable to match, and a climate control system that is beyond anything available in the 21st century, the magic suits also provided astronauts with breathable air, which definitely came in handy. What the suits did, in essence, was provide the astronauts with their own little portable, climate-controlled, radiation-protected atmosphere. Of course, to actually do that, if we're pretending that it could be done at all, the suits would have had to have been pressurized. And it is perfectly obvious from all of the photos that the suits were not, in fact, pressurized. Because if they were, the astronauts would have looked like the Michelin Man bouncing around on the surface of the moon. The magic suits had to perform one other function as well. They had to serve as head-to-toe body armor because the moon, according to NASA, had a serious problem with drive-by shootings from outer space. Seriously, I'm not making that up. I read it on NASA's own website. In the very same NASA post that discusses moon rocks being constantly bombarded with absurdly high levels of radiation, another curious admission can be found. Quote, Meteoroids constantly bombard the moon. Our old friend from NASA, David McKay, explains that, quote, Apollo moon rocks are peppered with tiny craters from meteoroid impacts. Quote, NASA explains then that that could only happen to rocks from a planet with little or no atmosphere, like the moon. Unquote. Meteoroids, NASA continues, are nearly microscopic specks of space dust that fly through space at speeds often exceeding 50,000 miles per hour, 10 times faster than the speeding bullet. They pack a considerable punch. The tiny space bullets can plow directly into moon rocks, forming miniature and unmistakable craters. According to NASA, every square inch of every exposed surface of every rock allegedly gathered from the surface of the moon shows this pattern. By extension, then, we know that every square inch of the lunar surface is peppered with meteoroid craters. There really is no safe place to hang out. There you are minding your own business, lining up your golf shot, and the next thing you know, a meteoroid is ripping through your spacesuit at 50,000 miles per hour. That has to sting a little bit. Actually, what it would do is kill you, almost instantaneously, not the projectile itself, which probably wouldn't be lethal after passing through the spacesuit, but ripping or puncturing your magic suit while on the moon is certainly something that you would want to avoid. You know that old saw about nature abhors a vacuum? How that applies here is that any penetration of your suit would result in all the air being immediately sucked out, and then your blood would begin to boil, and that can be rather unpleasant. I guess the Apollo crews really dodged a bullet on that one. Not one of the astronauts was hit, nor any of the lunar modules, nor any of the lunar rovers, nor any of the equipment that was used. I have to say here, by the way, that those Apollo guys were studs of the highest magnitude. Did they know what they were signing up for? What did NASA's ad say? Astronauts wanted. No experience necessary. Duties will include taking a trip to the moon. Return trip cannot be guaranteed. Applicant must be able to withstand levels of radiation higher than anything that can be generated here on Earth. Applicant must also be able to work comfortably in heat in excess of 250 degrees Fahrenheit, as well as in cooler conditions approaching minus 300 degrees. A continuous supply of breathable air may or may not be provided by employer. Snacks and water will be necessarily limited to what fits an employee-provided lunchbox. Restroom facilities will not be available. The ability to dodge 50,000 miles per hour space bullets is not required, but would be helpful. This is a great money-making opportunity. Paychecks will be picked up upon return to Earth. The Apollo guys didn't have to worry about any of that, of course, because they were wearing the magic suits. Apparently, those suits were yet another example of NASA digging deep into the well of lost 1960s technology. A huge shout out, by the way, is in order for the guys at NASA for posting that article about the moon rocks being bombarded with radiation and meteorites. It makes it so much easier for me when NASA has already done so much of the work of debunking the moon landings. 
When announced on January 14, 2004 that America was going to be returning to the moon, we were quickly advised by NASA types and various television talking heads that such a goal would require about 15 years to achieve. No one in the media thought to ask why it would take 15 years to do with 21st century technology what it only took 8 years to accomplish with 1960s technology. Not one voice was raised to ask how with the twin advantages of improved technology and prior experience would it still take twice as long this time around. It's not after all as if we have to reinvent the wheel here. Not only have we done this before, we've done it safely and reliably. How could NASA possibly improve upon the record of the Apollo missions? What could they come up with that could outperform those vintage Saturn V rockets that made it to the moon every time and made it home safe every time? How do you improve upon a lunar module that not only performed flawlessly every time, but that was also the very model of lightweight, compact efficiency. When you have a system that performs flawlessly on six incredibly technologically complex missions and that delivers your astronauts home safely even on the one occasion that the systems run amok, why in the world would you toss it in the trash and start from scratch the next time around? According to a Fox News report published after this announcement, quote, the effort to return to the moon will require building new spacecraft and sending out robotic craft to provide materials to be used later by human explorers, say experts. I wonder why they would need to do that. We didn't need to do stuff like that last time. Why does NASA keep insisting on reinventing the wheel here? Why do they seem to have forgotten that we're old hands at this sort of thing? Anyway, doesn't it seem just a little strange that experts would now suggest that if we get to work right away, we might be able to land men on the moon by the year 2020? Isn't that like saying with a lot of hard work and a little luck, we might be able to develop a video game as technologically advanced as Pong by the year 2025? Or that by 2030, the scientific community might produce a battery-operated calculator small enough to fit into your pocket? And if you think that if we do go back, the voice actors will be given a better script, a NASA statement released in July of this year contained a rather curious assertion. Quote, Conspiracy theories are always difficult to refute because of the impossibility of proving a negative. Unquote. It is not, of course, NASA that is being asked to prove a negative, but rather those pesky conspiracy theorists. NASA is merely being asked to prove a positive, which should be a relatively easy task. All they have to do is produce some actual evidence beginning with all those reels of tape containing the telemetry data, the biomedical data, all the voice communications, the original videotape. They could also release the plans and specifications for all that fancy space hardware and maybe offer some kind of reasonable explanation for why so many of the official photographs are demonstrably fraudulent. Alternatively, they could just send some guys back there to prove that it can be done. It's been 37 years and counting since the last guest on the moon checked out. NASA allegedly filmed that final liftoff from the moon, by the way. In case you haven't seen the historic film footage, you can view it here. It's a very short clip, and it's actually quite funny, so be sure to check it out. Ignition. Right away, Houston. Reds are good. Excellent. Good over. over. I do you have good thrust. I can't be 100% certain of this, of course, but I have a very strong hunch that NASA picked up this footage off the cutting room floor after Ed Wood had finished editing Plan 9 from Outer Space. Actually, I probably shouldn't joke about the clip because I kind of do feel bad for the guy that they had to leave behind to operate the camera. I wonder how he's doing these days. Actually, NASA claims that the camera was mounted to the abandoned lunar rover even in space Americans are arrogant litter bugs, and that pan and zoom functions were operated remotely by the ground crew back on Earth. You couldn't control your television from across the room, but NASA could pan and zoom a camera from 234,000 miles away. And there apparently either wasn't any delay in signal or NASA had the foresight to hire a remote camera operator who was able to see a few seconds into the future. You have to really hand it to the NASA boys. Those guys think of everything. The visionary proposal envisioned the moon as a stepping stone for manned travel to Mars. How that works, though, is a bit of a mystery to me. The minimum distance astronauts would have had to travel to reach Mars from the Earth is 36 million miles. And the minimum distance astronauts would have to travel to reach Mars from the moon is also 36 million miles. So I guess what I'm wondering is, what exactly would be gained by making a pit stop on the moon? But let's take a big bite out of the reality sandwich here, shall we? The human animal is quite simply not equipped for space travel beyond low Earth orbit. There is virtually no chance that we are going to send men to the moon anytime soon. Despite what NASA would like you to believe, the combination of lethal space radiation, lethal temperatures, a complete lack of breathable air, and a lower gravitational attraction that produces serious health problems, including rapid tissue and bone degeneration, is simply not compatible with human existence. Neither is getting pelted with space bullets. Neither is a lack of food and water. 
Astronaut Steve Lindsay, after being chosen to command the final planned mission of the space shuttle, had this to say, quote, Everybody at NASA feels the same way. We're in favor of taking the next step and getting out of low Earth orbit. So while technology in every other realm of human existence continues to take giant strides forward, everyone at NASA appears to want to take a big step backward to 1969. Before bidding adieu, I have one final note to add. A certain Dr. Thomas Gold was an early skeptic of the feasibility of landing on the moon. He made headlines prior to the alleged flight of Apollo 11 when he predicted that any attempt at a moon landing would be disastrous. NASA, of course, purportedly proved the good doctor wrong. Longtime readers will remember that Dr. Gold was America's first prominent proponent of the abiotic theory of oil and gas production, and that he went and dropped dead just before the peak oil propaganda started to heat up. Dr. Gold was recently proven to be correct on the origins of so-called fossil fuels, and that article is linked here. The article, curiously enough, refers to the research as, quote, revolutionary, which it is, I suppose, if you ignore the fact that the Soviets and Ukrainians did the same research and drew the same conclusions some 50 years earlier. We all know that that can't be true, however, because it would be impossible to keep a secret of that magnitude from the entire Western world. Right? Wagging the Moon Doggy, Part 6, by David McGowan. It took pilots 50 years to progress from scarf and goggles barnstorming to setting down footprints on the Sea of Tranquility. It will have taken another half century for us to return to the moon. David Nolan, writing in Popular Mechanics, March 2007. According to the latest from NASA, we won't be returning even after another half century has passed. It was to be such a big event that NASA decided to throw an all-night party at its Ames Research Center to celebrate. Moon-themed movies and a big screen set up for the main event, what NASA billed as the, quote, spectacular L-Cross lunar impacts. According to a media advisory, linked, NASA's Lunar Crater Observation and Sensing Satellite, LCROSS, mission will come to a dramatic conclusion at approximately 4.30 a.m. Pacific Time, 7.30 a.m. Eastern Time, on Friday, October 9, 2009, with the impact of the LCROSS Centaur upper stage rocket, and four minutes later, the impact of the LCROSS shepherding spacecraft into Cavius Crater near the moon's south pole. To mark the event, NASA Ames Research Center is hosting LCROSS Impact Night. News media are invited to cover the three-part event that is open to the public and free of charge. Clear back in June when the mission was launched, Scientific American explained to readers how, quote, scientists expect the blast to be so powerful that a huge plume of debris will be ejected. The second impact, the magazine further explained, would produce a spectacular explosion that should be visible in amateur astronomers' telescopes. The plan was that the first impact would send up such a huge cloud of lunar dust and debris. The larger spacecraft would then follow the same course directly through the cloud before necessarily crashing into the surface of the moon. It would have only four minutes to gather data and transmit it back to Earth. As the LA Times explained the day before the big event, quote, if all goes according to plan, the spacecraft will fly through the cloud of debris that will rise above the lunar surface and linger there briefly. As it passes through the cloud, the satellite's nine instruments will analyze the dust and debris for evidence of water before crashing itself. So in addition to providing a spectacular show, the mission was also going to feed the American public's need for instant gratification by providing some relatively quick results. In that short four-minute span of time, we would gather all the data needed to determine within days if there is water frozen in the deep craters on the moon. The Times noted that, quote, scientists preparing for the collision could hardly contain their excitement over what might turn up in that short time. The crowd at Ames was expected to number in the thousands, possibly even as many as 10,000, all there to see, quote, a dust cloud rising as much as six miles above the lunar surface, providing a rare show for amateur astronomers with telescopes 10 inches or longer. In addition to gathering at the Ames complex, countless other viewing parties were organized around the country and around the world to view NASA's live footage. Amateurs were dutifully lined up at their telescopes awaiting the show. And the Times noted, quote, observatories around the world will be watching, along with the Hubble Space Telescope and the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Steve Hickson, Vice President of Advanced Concepts at Northrop Grumman, the manufacturer of the spacecraft, assures reporters that the craft was, quote, looking great. I don't think we could miss the moon now, if we tried. A full 40 years ago, we were able to set a manned spacecraft gently down on the moon and then fire the engine back up and fly home. Now, with four decades of additional experience and vastly improved technology, all we had to do was send an unmanned spacecraft on a one-way mission to crash into the moon. How could NASA possibly mess that up? The media kept referring to the LCROSS mission as the, quote, bombing of the moon. Given that NASA is essentially an arm of the U.S. Department of Defense, this should have been a cakewalk. The last time I checked, no one knew more about dropping bombs and firing missiles than the U.S. military. No other country on Earth has come anywhere close to dropping as many bombs on as many parts of the world as Uncle Sam has. 
The moon may well be the only landmass within reach of the United States that we haven't bombed before. With the United States having long led the world in both lunar exploration and blowing stuff up, this mission couldn't really have been any easier, so it came as no surprise that everyone seemed to be brimming with confidence. As it turned out, the front page space that all the major media outlets had undoubtedly set aside for the dazzling images wasn't needed after all. With all eyes on the moon, what all those viewing parties and all those amateur astronomers and all those giant telescopes saw was absolutely nothing. The first impact was supposed to be captured on live video, being back from the second spacecraft, never materialized. As the LA Times politely put it, quote, the plume failed to show on screen. There is an explanation, of course, quote, some scientists suspect the camera settings on the second spacecraft were incorrect, preventing it from spotting the plume. You would think, though, that with the importance of the second craft being able to see the plume so that it could then fly through it, that they would have gotten that detail right. But apparently they just don't have the quality control over at NASA that they had back in 1969. As for why none of the amateur or professional telescopes aimed at the moon captured the first plume or the allegedly even larger second plume, well, NASA's going to have to get back to you on that, but probably not right away. The Times was quick to reassure readers that, quote, scientists might still pluck success from the mission's anticlimactic ending. At a news conference more than two hours after the crash, mission scientists confirmed that the Centaur rocket made a crater when it hit, and that crater was about the expected size of more than 60 feet across. There's no way to confirm that claim, of course, since the ship allegedly impacted inside a two-mile-deep, pitch-black crater that hasn't seen daylight for millions of years, which is exactly why it was targeted. And how pointless, by the way, was this mission? The goal was supposedly to discover if there were large deposits of frozen water on the moon that could be mined to provide water, breathable oxygen, and rocket fuel for future lunar exploration and colonization. The water, if it exists, is at the bottom of deep, permanently black craters, where the temperature is said to hover around minus 400 degrees Fahrenheit. At those temperatures, the scientific community tells us the water would be frozen as hard as a rock. Even if we assume that NASA could overcome all the problems with getting astronauts to the moon and guaranteeing their survival while there, how exactly would they recover that water? Toss bombs in the craters and then try to run around and gather all the chunks of ice before they melt at plus 280 degrees? Drive down into the craters in one of those folding dune buggies with flashlights and a couple of battery-powered jackhammers, some warm clothes, and a bunch of batteries? We're going to build a giant mechanized water extraction facility of some kind with parts brought up one at a time from Earth? How long do you suppose that will take? It's anyone's guess what the real purpose of this mission was, but whatever goals were being pursued, it doesn't seem to have gone so well. All that can be said for sure is that NASA appears to be but a shadow of its former self. Once upon a time, we were able to blast men off into space and then turn on our televisions and watch them just four days later stroll around on the moon. Nowadays, we send off an empty spaceship, wait patiently for nearly four months, and then watch as NASA fails to successfully crash that empty ship into the moon. Since the news media fell asleep at the wheel and failed to bring you the spectacular images that had been promised, I dropped by NASA's website to pick up a few and bring them to you. The following three photos were labeled as L-Cross Impact Images. Following that is a link to NASA's thrilling live video footage. Enjoy the show. It's quite dazzling. Did anyone notice, by the way, all the other lunar modules that are recognizable in the larger image captured by NASA's LRO? As will be recalled, they are recognizable by the long shadows they cast. There are, most notably, probably near a dozen of them clustered around the crater to the right of the image. I wonder how the boys at NASA figured out which one was the real lunar module. Great photographs. Need to go check them out, guys. And that is the end of Part 6. The Moon Doggy Part 7 by David McGowan. The LEM Lunar Excursion Module was coated in mylar. To many engineers, the final vehicle was an insult to every notion of what a spacecraft should look like. It was one of the weirdest and most improbable flying machines ever conceived. Moon Machines, the Lunar Module, Science Channel, 2008. 
While idly flipping through the channels the other day, I noticed that the Science Channel was planning to air a couple of moon landing documentaries. Luckily, I was a bit bored that day, so I decided to tune in. Bill was not really expecting much beyond the standard claims that have been made in numerous other documentary films, focusing on the alleged Apollo missions. I was pleasantly surprised, however, to find that the two hours that I spent watching the Science Channel spin the moon landings was time well spent, seeing as how I picked up quite a few facts that I had not previously come across in other source material. The most important thing that I learned was a lesson of sorts. Never attempt to mock the Apollo missions, for the simple reason that such efforts will be in vain, since no claim made in jest, no matter how absurd, can ever atop the lunacy of the actual claims made by NASA and its subsidiaries. The better of the two televised documentaries was Moon Machines, the Lunar Module, which turned out to be part of a series which, as luck would have it, is readily available on Netflix, with all six hours conveniently packaged on a single DVD. Netflix seemed to think that I might also enjoy Nova's two-hour To the Moon and the Discovery Channel's multi-part When We Left Earth, so I added those to my queue as well. Having now absorbed everything that these have to offer, I realized that my debunking of the alleged moon landings wasn't really as thorough as it could have been, so another chapter is on order, maybe two or three, perhaps even four. Moon Machines, the Lunar Module began by having a talking head explain to viewers that when JFK delivered his historic speech on May 25th of 1961, the one in which he boldly proclaimed that Americans would walk on the moon by the close of the decade, quote, The United States had a total of 15 minutes of spaceflight experience, and now we were committed to go to the moon. We knew nothing about the moon, unquote. Indeed, if Kennedy had delivered that speech just three weeks earlier, this statement would have to be modified to, quote, The United States had no flight experience at all, and now we're committed to going to the moon. On May 5, 1961, Alan Shepard had become the first American in space when he took a 15-minute ride in a Mercury capsule that basically went up and then came right back down. That mission was a hastily assembled, hey look, we can do it to response to the USSR having put the first man in space on April 12, 1961. Shepard's accomplishment didn't even come close to what the Soviets had achieved. Yuri Gagarin had ridden the Vostok 1 into low Earth orbit, completing a single orbit in 1 hour and 48 minutes. In comparison, Shepard had essentially taken a short ride aboard an oversized bottle rocket. It would take another four months until September 13, 1961 for the United States to get its first unmanned spacecraft to complete an Earth orbit. It would not be until near the end of February 1962, nearly a year after Gagarin's flight, that NASA would claim to have gotten an American, John Glenn, into orbit. On the day of Gagarin's historic flight, a clearly uncomfortable President Kennedy fielded questions from a concerned press corps. If we intended to beat the Russians to the moon, Kennedy testily replied that, quote, We first have to make a judgment based on the information we can get whether we can be ahead of the Russians to the moon. Asked a follow-up question about the Saturn rockets already under development by the Von Braun team, and obviously annoyed Kennedy replied that, quote, Saturn is still going to put us well behind. Conrad Dannenberg, a rocket propulsion engineer who worked alongside von Braun for some 33 years, first in Nazi Germany and then in Huntsville, Alabama, readily agreed that, quote, they, the Soviets, were really in all areas way ahead of us. So despite the frequent claims of the debunkers that it was actually a really close race, or that the Soviets weren't really leading at all, everyone from the president to the scientists who actually designed and built the machines that allegedly took us to the moon agreed at the time that the Soviets were far ahead of the U.S. in virtually all aspects of the space race. Truth be told, I appear to have sold the Soviets short by leaving out a number of the early accomplishments of their space program, including a couple of firsts that the United States was unable to match for decades. Here then is a more complete list of Russian firsts in the years leading up to and during the alleged Apollo missions. May 15, 1957, the Soviet Union tests the R-7 Semyorka, the world's first intercontinental ballistic missile. October 4, 1957. The Soviets launch Sputnik 1, Earth's first man-made satellite. November 3, 1957, a dog named Laika becomes the first animal to enter Earth orbit aboard Sputnik 2. January 2, 1959, Luna 1 becomes the first man-made object to leave Earth's orbit. September 13, 1959, after an intentional crash landing, Luna 2 becomes the first man-made object on the moon. October 6, 1959, Luna 3 provides mankind with its first look at the far side of the moon. August 20, 1960, Belka and Stroka aboard Sputnik 5 are the first animals to safely return from Earth orbit. October 14, 1960, Marsnik 1, the first probe sent from Earth to Mars, blasts off. February 12, 1961, Venera 1, the first probe sent from Earth to Venus, blasts off. 
April 12, 1961. Yuri Gagarin, writing aboard the Vostok 1, becomes the first man in Earth orbit. May 19, 1961. Venera 1 performs the first ever flyby of another planet, which is Venus. August 6, 1961. German Titov aboard the Vostok 2 becomes the first man to spend over a day in space and the first to sleep in Earth orbit. August 11th and 12th, 1962, Vostok 3 and Vostok 4 are launched, the first simultaneous manned flights, though they do not rendezvous. October 12, 1964, Voskhod 1, carrying the first multi-man crew, is launched. March 18, 1965, Alexei Leonov, riding aboard the Voskhod 2, performs the first spacewalk. February 3, 1966, Luna 9 becomes the first probe to make a controlled, soft landing on the moon. March 1, 1966, Venera 3, launched November 16, 1965, becomes the first probe to impact another planet, Venus. April 3, 1966, Luna 10 becomes the first man-made lunar satellite. October 30, 1967, Cosmos 186 and Cosmos 188 become the first unmanned spacecraft to rendezvous and dock in Earth orbit. The United States will not duplicate this maneuver for nearly four decades. January 16, 1969, Soyuz 4 and Soyuz 5 become the first manned spacecraft to dock in Earth orbit and the first to exchange crews. November 17, 1970, the Luna Code 1, the first robotic rover to land on and explore an extraterrestrial body, lands on the moon. 27 years later, the United States lands its very first robotic rover on Mars. December 15, 1970, Venera 7 becomes the first probe to make a soft landing on another planet. April 19, 1971, Salyut 1 becomes the world's first orbiting space station. And August 22, 1972, Mars 2 becomes the first probe to reach the surface of Mars. I feel much better now that we've set the record straight on all that. The Soviets achieved the first flyby of the moon, launched the first craft to impact the moon, were the first to make a soft landing on the moon, put the first object into lunar orbit, and remain to this day the only nation to land and operate a robotic vehicle on the moon. It should now make perfect sense to everyone then why the Soviets, who were ahead of us in virtually all aspects of space exploration, in some cases by decades, never landed a man on the moon. Or even sent a man to orbit the moon. Come to think of it, they never even sent a dog to the moon. It would have been difficult to argue that the Russians didn't have adequate funding for their space program, or that they didn't have some of the finest scientific minds on the planet working for that space program, or that they didn't have the will or the desire to succeed. What they were lacking, I'm thinking, is access to Hollywood production facilities. Returning then to our prior topic of discussion, on April 14, 1961, two days after Gagarin's historic flight, a panicked Kennedy reportedly inquired of NASA what goal in space we might be able to attain before the Soviets. According to legend, Kennedy was told that America's best hope to beat the Russians was with a manned moon landing. The reasoning was that the Soviets were so far ahead of us that they would surely trounce us in achieving any milestones attainable in Earth orbit, space walks, prolonged flight, rendezvous and docking maneuvers, etc. So our best bet was to shoot for a far-off goal. The problem, however, was that none of the technology required to attain such a goal existed at that time. We did not have the rocket technology to power such a mission, nor the navigation system to guide such a journey, nor the digital computer technology to control that navigation system, nor the spacesuit technology to protect our astronauts, nor the technology to rendezvous or dock in space, nor the technology to create a dune buggy capable of operating on the moon, nor the technology to design and create a lunar landing vehicle. NASA had been in existence for less than three years, having been created in 1958 as a direct response to the USSR's launch of Sputnik. Nevertheless, just eight summers later, we allegedly did indeed land men on the moon. In just eight short years, starting essentially from scratch, we designed, built, tested, refined, and perfected every piece of technology required to put men on the moon. And we did it so well in the brief period of time that by July 1969, every cog in the wheel performed flawlessly. And yet now, with a half century of space exploration now under our belts, and with all the necessary technology long perfected, NASA advises us that it would take twice as long to put a man on the moon. But I may have already pointed that out. Following Kennedy's bold declaration, nobody really had a clue how to get astronauts to the moon and back. One school of thought held that what was needed was a humongous rocket ship that would fly all the way there and land and then fly all the way back. 
The main drawback to this proposal was that it was completely preposterous. The biggest problem was that it would somehow require landing a 300 foot tall cylinder in a perfectly upright position. But that wasn't the only problem. Getting in and out of a capsule amounted atop such a tall rocket ship can be a bit of a problem as well, as well as relaunching that rocket without a launch pad and a ground crew. Another idea called for the launch of two large rocket ships, one primarily carrying fuel and the other carrying our fearless astronauts. The idea was that the two vehicles would rendezvous and dock in Earth orbit. The manned ship would refuel from the other ship and our boys would then leave for the moon. Why this was deemed necessary is anyone's guess, given that the debunkers generally claim that you don't really need much fuel once you leave Earth orbit because you just kind of fall through the vacuum of space until you get to the moon. Amidst all the preposterous ideas on how to get our guys to the moon ahead of the Ruskies, one lone voice in the wilderness, an obscure engineer by the name of John Hubolt, had been promoting a radically different plan. Build a second lightweight spacecraft to be carried aboard the larger mothership that would be capable of shuttling down to the moon and back while the larger ship remained in lunar orbit. There was only one massive drawback. To get back to Earth would require the lunar shuttle to rendezvous with the mothership in lunar orbit. What scared everybody about it was that you had to rendezvous and dock around the moon. You're a quarter of a million miles from Earth, and he's proposing this in 1961 when we had no spaceflight experience and just rendezvousing in Earth orbit concerned everybody. Needless to say, everyone scoffed at Hubolt's radical suggestion. The very vocal opposition at NASA was led by Mr. Von Braun who categorically and heatedly dismissed the notion of completing a lunar orbit rendezvous. The idea, by the way, appears to have been cribbed from an early Soviet study. But Hubolt was allegedly tenacious sort who wasn't about to give up easily. Even going so far as to write directly to Bob Siemens at the top of the NASA food chain on November 15, 1961, Hubolt was, of course, immediately taken seriously by the NASA brass, who promptly decreed that his ideas should get a serious hearing. A major turning point was supposedly reached when a meeting was convened in June of 1962. During that historic meeting, we were informed by the narrator of Moon Machines, quote, Von Braun took everybody by surprise. Ferner's own team gave a detailed presentation to the assembled scientists, after which Von Braun thanked and profusely complimented them, before telling them that he was going to recommend that NASA not go with his own team's concept. Instead, he was going to recommend the so-called LRO, or Lunar Orbit Rendezvous Option. Jumping down, quote, it is such a surprise to everybody that even his own staff people several days later had a private meeting with him and they said, why in the world did you say that? Why indeed? My guess is that someone finally passed Werner the memo explaining that we needed to get over the silly notion that the plan was to actually go to the moon. What was needed instead was a plan that could be feasibly sold to the American people. Curiously, Mr. Hubel, who we are led to believe was single-handedly responsible for selling NASA on the lunar module concept, and without whom we probably would have never allegedly sent men to the moon at all, has been all but forgotten. That seems a rather strange way for history to treat a man whose brilliant mind allegedly opened the door for man to walk on the moon. The man whose name is most commonly referenced when discussing the lunar module, by the way, is a gent by the name of Thomas Kelly, who served as the project manager for the design, construction, and testing of the LEM. Kelly happened to be a member of the Quill and Dagger Society, Cornell University's answer to Yale University's notorious skull and bones. I just thought maybe I should mention that. In July of 1962, NASA announced that it was fully committed to the lunar shuttle concept and began shopping around for a contractor to build it. As fate would have it, a small aircraft company on Long Island, the Grumman Corporation, had already been working on the design of an independent lunar shuttle vehicle. Cleverly anticipating the market demand, Grumman thus was able to submit a much more detailed proposal than other competitors, sealing the deal with NASA. In November of 1962, Grumman was awarded the contract to build what Moon Machines described as, quote, the most complicated and sophisticated spacecraft ever conceived. Soon after, we're also informed that the LEM was, quote, what many regarded as the first true spaceship. In other words, America's, quote, first true spaceship was also America's most complicated and sophisticated spacecraft. To this day, no other spacecraft has been built that is capable of landing men on a planetary body. To this day, no other spacecraft has been built that is capable of taking off from and flying home from a planetary body. To this day, no other spacecraft has been built that is capable of performing rendezvous and docking maneuvers in lunar orbit. To this day, no other spacecraft has been built that can protect astronauts from the hazards of flying through space outside of the Van Allen belts. When you think about it, of course, it makes perfect sense that America's first true spacecraft, coming as it did from the infancy of the space age, would also stand to this day as the most complicated and sophisticated spacecraft, quote, ever conceived. 
After all, didn't Henry Ford build the most complicated and sophisticated automobile ever conceived? And didn't Orville and Wilbur build the most complicated and sophisticated aircraft ever conceived? And didn't Alexander Graham Bell invent the iPhone? From the outset, Grumman envisioned a two-stage vehicle with as much of the weight as possible carried in the lower half or descent stage of the spacecraft. Eliminating excess weight was of paramount importance. Early designs included no ladder, for example, as a ladder was considered unnecessary weight. In 1-6 gravity, it was assumed, the astronauts would be able to climb in and out of the capsule using just a rope. Of course, the modules never came anywhere close to being in a reduced gravity environment, which is probably why a ladder was added to the landing vehicle. According to the Science Channel, the only constant in Grumman's drive to design the modules was change. So much so that, quote, finally in the spring of 1965, NASA, worried design changes would never stop, imposed a freeze. NASA had apparently decided that two and a half years working in the knowledge and technology of the early 1960s was plenty of time to design the most complicated and sophisticated spacecraft ever conceived. Whatever the Grumman team had come up with to that point would have to be good enough to get our flyboys from the mothership to the moon and back. It was now time to go to work actually building what was described as, quote, an entirely independent spacecraft with its own motors, fuel, life support system, and navigation equipment. To some at the time, it seemed excessive, unquote. To many others at the time, it just seemed ridiculous. I happened to stumble across, by the way, an image depicting a 1963 era LEM prototype parked on the surface of the moon. As has been the case throughout this series, the image comes directly from NASA's website, where it was proudly presented as image of the day. It shouldn't be too hard to figure out what it is that I love about this image, even if it does prove me to be a liar, given that I have previously claimed that none of NASA's moon photos depict any stars in the lunar sky. According to the folks of the Science Channel, the lunar module was, quote, built in one of the world's first clean rooms. In zero gravity, any floating foreign body would be a hazard. A hazard, that is, to both the astronaut's health and to the ship's delicate onboard electronics. Workers were required to wear gowns, masks, hairnets, and booties. Technicians meticulously cleaned the interior with camel hair brushes and filter paper, and the modules were robotically lifted, inverted, and shaken to rid the cabin of any debris. Left unexplored by the makers of moon machines was the obvious question of how those clean room conditions could have been maintained once the landers sat down on the moon. The astronauts couldn't shed their protective suits until they were back in the safety of the pressurized capsule. So how exactly did they keep from tracking copious amounts of that lunar dust back into the allegedly sterile LEM cabin? As is revealed in the Lunar Rover episode of the Moon Machine series, quote, the astronauts quickly learned that the dust adhered to everything it touched. Everything, that is, except the outside of the lunar module, which, as we have already seen, remained as clean as if it were sitting on the showroom floor. And the dust apparently didn't also adhere to the astronauts' boots or spacesuits, even if Apollo astronaut Charlie Duke did say, while describing what it was like to ride in the lunar rover, that, quote, moon dust was pouring down on us like rain. And so after a half a moonwalk, our white suits turned gray. None of that dust, of course, was introduced into the sterile interior of the cabin. We know that with absolute certainty because we've already been told that in order for the lunar module to operate safely and correctly, the cabin had to be kept dust-free. Astute readers, by the way, may have noticed that Duke's comments about driving the rover directly contradict another of the fables sold by the debunkers. Who then are we to believe, the guy who actually operated the rover allegedly on the surface of the moon and said that dust was raining down on he and his partner from all directions, or a couple of self-proclaimed experts, who directly contradict NASA's man on the scene? There is a reason, I might add here, why NASA defers to these while not officially endorsing their debunking arguments. It's called plausible deniability. NASA knows that debunking the fact that the moon landings were hoaxed requires a lot of twisting of facts and the promotion of a lot of dubious science, and they choose not to be directly involved in such endeavors. And that brings us to the end of Part 7 of Wagging the Moon Doggy, Wagging the moon Doggy Part 8 by David McGowan. Whenever I saw a model of the lunar module, it had these rigid sides and it looked really strong. Turns out that external portions of the lunar module are made up of mylar and cellophane and it's put together with scotch tape and staples. We had to have pads on the floor because if you dropped a screwdriver, it would go right through. Jim Lovell, astronaut, Gemini 7, Gemini 12, Apollo 8, and Apollo 13. A quick note before moving on, a little research has revealed that NASA now acknowledges that maintaining clean room conditions on space exploration vehicles while performing EVAs on planetary bodies poses a bit of a problem. The agency's solution is something known as a suit port. 
The basic idea is to design a rear entry spacesuit that will remain attached to the exterior of the vehicle when not in use. The astronaut will enter through the rear of the suit and then detach himself from the vehicle. Re-entry will require reversing the procedure. NASA has even generously provided an image of a proposed lunar rover with two integrated suit ports as seen above. The agency feels that such technology will be required for any return trips to the moon or for landing on and exploring other planets. As with the space radiation shield that will also be required for any return trips to the moon, NASA offers no explanation for why such technology was not required back in 1969. Moving on then to the Lunar Module's propulsion system, we are informed that the LEM was equipped with two very different rockets. The first, so-called descent engine, would take the LEM from the command module down toward the lunar surface. It was an entirely new and untried piece of technology. Up until this point in history, no one had ever built a rocket engine with a throttle. They were either on or they were off. Since the LEMs never had to actually perform as advertised, it's doubtful that they actually had a throttle. It's doubtful that they even had engines. We're going to play along though, and pretend as though they did. Lynn Radcliffe, who managed the facility at White Sands that was specifically constructed to test and develop the LEM's rocket engines, describes the technology required to land the lunar modules. Quote, This was an unbelievable maneuver when you stop to think about it. I mean, you're sitting on a column of thrust, just hovering there like a helicopter, and then you let it go, the throttle, a little bit, and you lower just a few feet per second until you make contact. All of this is an amazing set of requirements to put on anyone trying to design a rocket. Radcliffe is absolutely right. I did stop and think about it, and it is unbelievable. What's interesting here, though, is that when I describe the technique that would have been used to land the modules as being very similar to the landing of a helicopter, some of the debunkers got their panties all in a wad over it, and yet here we have the guy who oversaw the development of the rocket engines describing the alleged landings in exactly the same manner. So I guess we can safely conclude that he really doesn't know what he's talking about either. And Gene Cowart, who served as Boeing's chief engineer on the Lunar Rover project from 1969 to 1971, didn't know what he was talking about either when he noted that the, quote, LEM, when it comes down over the moon, is not just immediately set down. It hovers over the moon. And Charlie Duke, the alleged pilot of the Apollo 16 lunar module, who was no doubt mistaken as well when he recently told James May, from James May on the Moon, that flying the lander, quote, was like flying a helicopter. Amusingly enough, while the landing of the lunar module was being described on moon machines, vintage animation from the gang at NASA Grumman was displayed on the screen. Below are a couple of screen caps of that animation. As with the verbal descriptions, of course, I'm sure this is just another case of the folks who actually designed and or operated the technology actually being clueless about how it was supposed to work. As it turns out, designing that throttle-equipped descent engine was child's play compared with the task of perfecting the spacecraft's second rocket engine. As our narrator solemnly intoned, quote, It was the module's second rocket, the so-called ascent engine, that caused Grumman the most lost sleep. It didn't need a throttle, but it did need to work with absolute reliability. As Len Radcliffe noted, you're totally dependent on the ascent engine to work to put you back in orbit. If for any reason the ascent engine failed to work, the astronauts are doomed. Dick Dunn, Grumman's director of public relations during the time of the alleged Apollo missions, described the astronauts' predicament in stark terms. Quote, two astronauts were going to climb into this thing, and essentially they were going to press a button. If it worked, it worked. And if it didn't, there weren't many things that they could do about it. To keep the operation of the engine as simple as possible, so-called hypergolic propellants were used. That is to say, a fuel and an oxidizer that explode on contact. That simplicity, though, came at a price. The fuels were extremely toxic. What most concerned Grumman's engineers was that the fuel was so corrosive that at the end of a test, each engine had to be rebuilt. It meant that the final assembly of an engine could never be tested. Unbelievably, explains Radcliffe, the first time these engines would ever have been fired, ever, no check out at the factory, the first time would be when they were fired on their mission. As Dunn noted, I don't think anyone could, at that time, tell you 100% that it was going to work. Seeing how the engines were completely untested, both in terms of being able to operate within the environment of the moon and in terms of the individual engines being factory tested to see if they worked at all, Dunn's evaluation would seem to be a bit of an understatement. Luckily, though, none of the landers actually made it to the moon. So whether the engines worked or not is a bit of a moot point. Another problem the Grumman team faced was how to adequately insulate the vehicle from the intense heat of the unshielded sun. There was, curiously enough, no mention throughout the hour about the necessity of shielding the craft from space radiation. As Stoff noted, you have to insulate the spacecraft as well as possible because there's huge fuel tanks in there and the fuel's going to boil, if not adequately protected. 
Also, we are informed the huge temperature variations on the moon could also cause the craft to buckle. Since weight was an issue, heavy heat shields could not be used. Luckily, though, DuPont had developed this new material. It was aluminized mylar. It was a gold color, and they found that if you built it up to perhaps 25 layers, it's an excellent insulator. DuPont Space Age material, as we all know, can be obtained pretty inexpensively these days, and it's still a very lightweight material. I wonder why it is then that you rarely see spaceships wrapped in it anymore. Meanwhile, down in Texas, astronauts had been training on a simulator that was supposed to teach them to land the lunar module. Unfortunately, the simulator was, quote, unstable and dangerous and never worked properly. No one ever actually landed the contraption, but on the plus side, there's lots of film stock of fiery simulator crashes. Stoff notes that, quote, at some point the program, NASA, eventually stopped using it because it was just, it was a lot safer to land on the moon than it was to fly this machine down in Texas. Of course it was. Why waste time with a simulator when the real thing was going to be so much easier? And NASA, no doubt, knew that would be the case before we even faked going to the moon. I'm pretty sure that Armstrong was pulled aside and told, don't worry about almost being killed in that simulator. The real thing is going to be so much easier. You'll see when you get up there. Just trust us on this one. And we're fairly certain that there is at least a slim possibility that the ascent engine will work when it's time for you and Buzz to come home. Unless you know you guys happen to get a dud. There's really no way for anyone to know for sure until you get there and try to fire it up. Have a safe trip. In the summer of 1967, the first space-ready LEM was delivered to Cape Kennedy to be loaded aboard the Apollo 4 launch vehicle. Incredibly, it has taken less than five years to get the, quote, most complicated and sophisticated spacecraft ever conceived from the chalkboard to the launch pad. And in the mid-1960s, no less. By the way, I happened to stumble across this footage of Apollo 4 sitting on the launch pad. It is, I have to say, a mighty impressive shot. Kudos to the non-astronaut photographer who snapped it. Wow, it's a great shot. The lunar module never made it aboard that impressive-looking rocket ship. Upon delivery, the module was found to have, quote, hundreds of problems, including bad wiring, faulty parts, an abundance of poor workmanship, and most alarmingly, serious leaks throughout the fuel system. Grumman had neglected, it seemed, to perform any pre-flight checks. Worse yet, as Grumman's team raced to correct the numerous problems, a pressure test caused a window to blow out, blasting jagged holes in the skin of the craft and sending debris flying throughout the formerly dust-free module. The cause of this blowout was never determined. NASA and Grumman, though, decided to take the what's the worst that could happen approach and merely replace the window and ignore the failed pressure test, making no design changes to the modules. After all, there was a timetable to adhere to. In the end, as we all know, the lunar modules performed flawlessly. According to legend, Neil Armstrong set the LEM down with barely 15 seconds of fuel remaining in the tank. And when he and Buzz fired up that ascent engine for the very first time, it popped them off the surface of the moon as if they were riding on a champagne cork. As it turned out, though, the lunar module had not yet faced its toughest challenge. In the spring of 1970, fittingly enough, on April 13, Apollo 13's command and service modules were allegedly rendered powerless by an explosion on the ship while cruising through space some 200,000 miles from home. Though in its official NASA footage, the windows of the module are filled with blue light, not the blackness of space. The oxygen tank explosion was allegedly powerful enough to do serious damage to the exterior of the craft, but apparently not powerful enough to alter the course of the ship. That was a lucky break for the guys. The three-man crew allegedly retreated to the two-man LEM, which, as we know, had its own oxygen and fuel supplies. Not only did the LEM allegedly keep the brave trio alive, but its descent engine was allegedly used to slingshot the crippled spacecraft around the moon and set in on a course back to Earth. Their ordeal wasn't over, though. While camped out in the LEM, the Apollo 13 astronauts were allegedly faced with another life-threatening situation. Carbon dioxide was rapidly building in the ship's confined airspace. Lithium hydroxide cartridges were supposed to remove the carbon dioxide, but there was a limited supply of said cartridges in the LEM. Luckily, though, there were additional cartridges in the command module, but they were incompatible. The command module's cartridges were square, while those in the LEM were round. What to do then? According to Moon Machines, the brain trust down at Mission Control had a brilliant idea. NASA suggested using duct tape and tubing from the spacesuits to jury-rig a connection. Dramatic pause. It worked. I, needless to say, was just being a smartass when I said that all we needed back in the 1960s was a roll of duct tape and we could MacGyver those spaceships to the moon and back. NASA, on the other hand, is dead serious when it says that it was indeed a roll of duct tape that got the Apollo 13 crew home, safe and sound. With, needless to say, a huge assist from that spunky little lunar module, which not only powered the flight home, but also kept three astronauts alive for nearly 100 hours, when it was only designed to keep two men alive for 50 hours. According to Lovell, who was on the Apollo 13 flight, 
We did it with duct tape and a piece of plastic and a piece of cardboard and an old sock. The key ingredient here seems to be the duct tape. It would probably be fair to say that with a roll of duct tape and any other two random items, you could fix most problems that might arise on a spaceship. Moving on then to the other Science Channel offering, a 2005 effort entitled First on the Moon, The Untold Story, we learned that Mission Control at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, quote, was not as high-tech as it looked. On television, it looked pretty damned impressive, for the era at least. As anyone alive in the time recalls, what the world saw was an enormous room filled with computer consoles, each staffed by a key member of the Apollo team diligently monitoring his computer screen for any signs of trouble. But in reality, as Apollo 11 computer engineer Jack Garman clues us in, quote, The computer screens that we looked at in Mission Control weren't computer screens at all. They were televisions. All the letters or characters, they were all hand-drawn. I don't mean with a brush, but I mean they were painted on a slide. But they sure looked pretty damn impressive. Jack Garman, by the way, was not just some random low-level computer hack recruited by the Science Channel to offer commentary. According to the official legend, Garmin was the guy on the Apollo 11 crew who cleared the Eagle to land despite the fact that multiple alarms were going off. That would tend to indicate that he was a pretty important player at Mission Control. Every one of those consoles on the floor of Mission Control was powered by a single mainframe computer that had the computing power of a single laptop computer. Actually, make that a 2005-era laptop computer. And the spaceship itself, that multi-staged engineering marvel, carried a computer roughly equivalent to what powers a modern digital watch. Total memory capacity was about 72 kilobytes, or just about enough to hold one of the smaller images on this page. As I was typing these very words, I realized that I was doing so on a genuine vintage 2005 laptop computer. If I were inclined to wear digital watches, which I am not, I would now be holding in my hands all the computing power needed to get me and a couple of friends to the moon and back. If we utilized the power of my desktop computer as well, and went down to the party store to get a few rolls of Mylar, we could probably make it all the way to Mars and back. Another curious fact that First on the Moon made note of was that, according to Harold Loden, Apollo 11 mission controller, quote, the skin on the crew cabin of the lunar module was very thin, and that was all done because of weight savings. Another added that, quote, if you really took your finger and poked hard at it, you could poke right through the outer skin of the spacecraft. It was about the thickness of two layers of aluminum foil. Project manager Thomas Kelly concurred, noting that, quote, the aluminum alloy skin of the crew compartment was about 12 one thousandths of an inch thick. That's the equivalent of about three layers of Reynolds wrap that you would use in the kitchen. It's difficult to see then why that window would have blown out during the LEM pressure test. You would think that the guys at Grumman would have securely duct taped it to the fuselage. And I'm also sure that had the window not blown out and released the pressure, the rest of the ship would have passed the pressure test with flying colors. It would appear that what was deployed by the mothership to get our guys down to the moon was essentially an oversized Jiffy Pop container, with the brainpower of a digital watch. The show's narrator was quick to point out that the astronauts had to be very careful while moving about in their bulky suits, lest they puncture or otherwise damage the delicate skin of the craft. What wasn't pointed out was that the vacuum of space had to be very careful as well, careful not to rip the pressurized craft to shreds the instant it was deployed. One would logically assume, by the way, the LEMs would have to be kept safely tucked away within the mothership until lunar orbit was achieved. But, according to NASA, that's not the case. The official legend holds that the lunar modules were deployed shortly after leaving Earth orbit, about three hours after blasting off, and that they then docked in a nose-to-nose -nose configuration with the command and service modules while both spacecraft were flying through the vacuum of space at either 17,000 or 25,000 miles per hour, depending on the source. In other words, for virtually the entire 234,000 mile journey from the Earth to the Moon, that flimsily constructed lunar module essentially served as the front bumper of the mothership, other than to allow for the creation of the little engine that could fable surrounding Apollo 13, which holds that the conjoined spaceships flipped over and the front bumper became the engine, it makes little sense why that would have to be done. Not only would it have exposed the fragile lunar modules to the hazards of a lengthy space flight, it could have also required a docking maneuver in outer space, one that seems to go unmentioned in the majority of the Apollo literature. Amazingly enough, not only were the lunar modules capable of making soft manned landings on the moon and of blasting off from the surface of the moon and of rendezvousing and docking with the mothership while in lunar orbit, they were also capable of docking with the mothership while cruising from the Earth to the moon. By my count, those spunky little modules had to dock no fewer than 17 times during the various Apollo missions, and they performed perfectly every time. Twice in Earth orbit on the Apollo 9 mission, and twice on each of the Apollo 10-17 to missions, except for Apollo 13, which did not complete the second docking maneuver. Let's pause here for a brief moment to reflect on the alleged plight of the unlucky Apollo 13 crew. There were no seats in the LEM, as it had been decided that they would just add unnecessary weight. 
and there was just barely room for two guys in the space allegedly being occupied by three. All three, had this have been a real life and death situation, would have been wearing bulky spacesuits, boots, gloves, and helmets. However, somehow they had to coexist for four days. During that time, all that would have separated them from the extreme hazards of outer space was a double layer of aluminum foil. One micrometeorite or one misplaced elbow would result in immediate death for the trio. As the narrator informs us during When We Left Earth, quote, If the flight suit fails or even tears a little, the difference in pressure will cause the astronaut's blood to boil, killing him instantly. The same would be true, of course, about the skin of the spacecraft. The smallest tear would mean instant death for all three. Of course, their suits would have allegedly provided a second line of defense, except that, as can be seen in one of the handful of Apollo 13 mission photos released by NASA, the astronauts weren't bothering to wear their suits as they cheerfully went about the business of MacGyvering their spaceship. As we already know, their cockiness was entirely justified since that aluminum foil capsule provided all the protection the astronauts needed to get home safely. No fewer than eight lunar modules allegedly made the hazardous voyage to the moon, and all of them arrived in immaculate condition. The Apollo 13 lunar module was exposed throughout virtually the entire mission, all the way to the moon and all the way back. In all, the eight LEMs allegedly logged some two million miles of unprotected space flight, and not one of them suffered so much as a scratch. That, my friends, is 1960s technology at its finest.